Hey, this is Mike Gilbert from Flotsam and Jetsam, and you're listening to KFMP, Misery Point Radio, with Mike Peacock, Flots Till Death. Dude, I appreciate you uh, you having me on here, man. Very, very, very cool. No, well, hey, thank you very much for, for joining me today. Uh, this has uh, been something I've been looking forward to doing for a long time. And finally, uh, now that things are kind of getting back into motion um, after being backed up for a while, uh, <laughs> things are kind of getting back in as the way they should be. So uh, so this is really cool. What uh, what have you been doing, you know, since since the whole, you know, COVID situation hit besides the music and stuff, which we'll get into. But what about you personally? What's uh, what's been occupying you for this last year or so? Oh, my God. Uh, it's it just it's crazy. I do a lot of pacing. So like and I'm going back and forth between the kitchen, back to the studio, the kitchen, you know, you can only play guitar for so many hours a day before you're just like, uh, uh, just, I want to stab myself with the headstock. Just, <laughs> but we, we, we just finished the record. So I, I did take a break from playing for a little while and, uh, you know, more focused on like our artwork and, you know, the business aspects of the band and stuff like that since, since all of our master tapes and everything have been turned in and they're ready, uh, ready for print. And we're really excited about our new record. I can't tell you it yet because it's going to be announced on uh, April fools. So it's, that's not a joke. We're uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a crazy day uh, to be releasing an album, but uh, it's coming out then and super excited about it. Uh, I haven't been this excited about one of our records for a long time. It's a perfect follow-up to the end of chaos. So I'm anxious to see what people say about it. I think they're going to dig it for a bunch of old guys playing metal. I think uh, I think we can we can still uh, throw the metal out there. Well, you know, I think that the uh, the old guys playing metal, if you will, has been a really common theme for the last couple of years. We've seen a lot of bands that kind of were on hiatus kind of come back, which is cool. Uh, you know, 2018 and forward, especially, we've just seen a lot of bands that, you know, I took a 20 year break, I took a 30 year break, or, you know, I had a seven or eight years with uh, nothing going on and people are revitalized. So I think that's awesome. The metal scene seems very healthy right now, which is amazing. And uh, I, I guess we'll just get into it then. Yeah, so, totally. so obviously your album that I was going to ask you about, which at this point is done, <laughs> all of the recordings done, all that kind of good stuff. So April 1st, you're going to make an announcement. I assume that you uh, recorded the majority of this probably between your studio and uh, some other member studios and then sent it off to kind of have it worked on. Yeah, that's kind of the, uh, we're, we're fortunate to have, we've got Ken Mary playing drums. He's got a, uh, a full studio at, at his at his studio, I guess you would call it. So um, he's got the full studio going on there. Steve, he's got studio means he's got a home studio. Uh, I've got a home studio. Uh, so, so it was very very easy for us to track stuff. And we, you know we're pretty lazy. We're not gonna we're not gonna get together. That sucks. I do miss that aspect of the band, like getting in a room and jamming. You know, because I, I do think it brings something to. Uh, uh, that you that just listeners hear they just hear that you, you know um but we have other members that live out of state so unfortunately we can't really do that so we put everything together in the studio and uh you know we're lucky to be able to, just to be able to do this technology lets us do this right now yeah who did you uh who did you have you know do all the all the final touches and mixing mastering and all that good stuff jacob hansen did the mixing and mastering he did our last record too, the end of chaos yeah so uh, this record, yeah, this record's going to be a, a perfect follow-up to it. It's going to sound a lot like it, but the songwriting is a little more over the top. Yeah. Uh, and I, th I think the playing is too, as far as our arthritis hasn't kicked in yet, so we're still <laughs> playing okay. <laughs> yeah, well, you got plenty of time for that, I'm sure. I, I assume you guys are sticking with AFM this time around as well. 
Yeah. They did a great job on the last record. They put together this amazing box set for the end of chaos. And that's what that. we're working on right now is uh, putting, putting something. I think they're going to do it again this time. So, you know, they had that, uh, that cool, like 3d, uh, lizard, uh, uh, he's, his name's Flotzilla, but on the front of it. And, uh, <laughs> it's just, it's just a cool, cool box set. Uh, memorabilia, you know, I, I love the memorabilia part of it. Yeah. I'm, you know, it... I'm always torn because, you know, I support, I love physical products. I just, I like having it in, cause I'm old school in that sense too. And I know that a lot of things have kind of gone digital, which is, you know, it's cool to have it kind of, you know, on your phone or on your device or, you know, whatever as an option. But when there's a badass box set or just a collector's item or just kind of a, a compendium or an anthology, I just get all nerdy and grabby on it. And uh, <laughs> there hasn't been a whole lot of that the last couple of years. And, and I, I kind of miss those days, but yeah, I, I think that's awesome that you guys are taking the physical level uh, with that as well. I, I think people are clamoring for it. They just want something, you know, it's, it's everything's been put on hold. And so everybody's like, just give me, just give me something cool, something tangible that I can hold in my hand and say, fuck yes. So uh, I'm, I'm yeah. one of those oh, guys yeah. too. <laughs> Yeah, you got this, like, um, there's an older crowd that, that loves the metal. You know, we grew up listening to this, like, when it when it sprouted. You know, we were all in our teens and stuff like that. And, you know, like, I always go back to, like, the old Van Halen records, you know, and I used to listen to Van Halen. I still do listen to Van Halen, but, like, when I when I bought, uh, you know, Van Halen 1, I would sit there with that, and I would just look at the album cover and memorize the back of it and – just everything about it, you know, the thanks list and everything, where it was recorded. And I, that's missing right now with uh, a lot of the newer audience, you know, like you, you could say, hey, ask, ask them, who's your favorite band? And they'll say, oh, uh, Breaking Benjamin. Well, well why? Uh, who's the guitar player? Well, I don't know. You know, that's what they say. Right. But, you know, when we were growing up as teens, everything that we were listening to, we knew everybody's names and we knew what was going on on you know with that not to say that they don't know what's going on but it's just like i just think with an album and uh, that aspect of it you 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 know you're just the mysteriousness of it makes you dive into it even more you know uh everything is so uh given to, to everybody these days video yeah it's like all you gotta do is turn on uh, youtube and you can see all any band you want to see you know uh, we we didn't have that option when we were when we were growing up we we waited in line and and fought our way to the front row so we could see <laughs> these guys jamming <laughs> yeah get all the way up to the front hopefully get there uh, maybe early enough and you get to see some sound check and check out their pedal boards and look at their amps and oh, yeah. kind of nerd out on all their stuff and maybe try to steal a set list when they weren't looking uh and then get you know your face smashed in by the guys that were three times your size so uh <laughs> i'm very familiar with that that's pretty awesome <laughs> Well, so you mentioned that you're kind of taking the the route with it that you went with uh, with End of Chaos. I mean, so that was a pretty big departure, even from say the previous the the self title album, which was also kind of a departure from from like uh, Ugly Noise and stuff like that. So you guys have constantly kind of evolved your sound over the years, but I'd say these last couple really skyrocketed things to a new level. Where do you go from that? I mean, how do you take what you did with End of Chaos and say, I really want to top this? Uh, I mean, the vocals were fucking spot on. The drums were killer. Guitars are awesome. It's it's heavy. It's melodic. I mean, I, I've heard people throw out the power metal phrase at you guys uh, over the last couple of years, and I definitely hear it, but it's still technical. It's still thrash. So how do you take that and say, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to do more with this new album? You know, it, it's really weird. Um uh how it's working out it's kind of a a, a bit of a, a, an assembly line you know when it comes to writing music because yeah uh, i'm from when the creativity of it is, is going to run out as being an older guy you know I, I i can still like write riffs like i just sit in my room write a riff and uh spawn something from it and when i'm done with it i'll kind of half-ass put it put together uh, uh an arrangement and i'll send it over to ak and then he'll send it back with some vocals on it or he'll send he'll sometimes he doesn't send any vocals back he'll just go that's a piece of shit <laughs> delete that you know so <laughs> brutal it, it's interesting the one yeah and then it, it's interesting that when he comes up when he starts feeling something the life of the song just comes together you know uh and it, it's everybody in the band writes which is uh and there's no like 
you know, one thing when we were younger, there was egos floating around and stuff like that. And sure. egos for, for bands that are starting out, I will, I will say like, the ego is like a cancer of your band, you know, like you guys, you got to let that stuff go because it'll, it'll ruin your band. But when you get five guys or however many people are in your band together writing and you guys all start clicking together, oh man, it, it, it there's, it's unlimited what you guys can do, you know, and, and we're finding that out right now, you know, uh, the self-titled record that was just after Ugly Noise is when we like started like feeling really comfortable working together, you know. Yeah. And we've gone through some lineup changes too, but, uh, you know, like Jason, uh, who was on the self titled record replaced Kelly Smith. That was, you know, since the beginning, uh, and Jason has since, uh, left and went to overkill, right. which is a fucking awesome band. Hell yeah. uh, we've done, we toured with them last, uh, last summer in Europe, which was, uh, what, what I can remember of it was pretty crazy. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And then, uh, you know, we just we actually just got another bass player. Uh, you know, we we parted with Michael Spencer. We've got a a, a dude named Phil Bodley right now, uh, who was actually sitting in for Michael on the days he couldn't uh, he couldn't tour. So, and uh, we get along. Phil's a brother, you know, so it was like an easy decision to make with that guy. Yeah. And we love hazing him, and you know the hazing part is a lot of fun. Just <laughs> fucking with the guy. It's kind of like a fraternity. I can't make him cry. <laughs> <laughs> can't make him cry. I'm sure his day is probably coming. So you know, and I guess you can't really expect. I mean, you guys <laughs> have been around since the fucking early '80s, and, and why would you not have lineup changes at this point? I mean, you yourself took a break for a while, and uh, and came on back, and yeah. so you know, bands change, bands evolve. Uh, I mean, it's very very few people that can say that they've had a band for you know longer than 10 years and still have all their original members so it's uh that's that's a big feat so yeah but your your lineup now seems seems pretty solid and from everything that i've gathered your songwriting process has been more inclusive like you said it's everybody's kind of got a piece of the pie and i assume that having that dynamic is really kind of what led to these last couple albums coming in the way that they came in yeah totally uh you know, in some of the earlier records, uh, I was writing a lot of the music, and I, I'm kind of glad that that – I don't want to – I love doing it, but I don't want to be totally responsible for that. You know, I love working with somebody else doing it and having uh, – you know, I, I, I love somebody telling me my song's a piece of crap. Let me uh, <laughs> let, let me let me throw this in there and then make it 100 times better. It's just, you know, five minds working together is way better than one. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm, I will definitely always go with that. It's just a way to do it. Yeah, for sure. And, and I assume, um, cause I heard that, you know, there was quite a bit of material left over from end to chaos. I'm, I'm assuming that some of that kind of got reworked and, and taken from the vault and maybe put into the hopper this time and, and, uh, transformed into new material. Actually it didn't. We ended up writing I, I, something like between Steve and I, cause you know, we always started with the music. We write the music first and then AK, you know, does what he wants with it. Sure. But I think we had between us uh, something like 45 songs written. And then, you know, AK just took the best, which, which worked for him. And uh, also the other aspect of that is Ken is an awesome songwriter too. Um, Ken Mary, the drummer. And uh, man, it, it just, for, for whatever reason, it just works. It all works together. And this, in this last record, we did the same thing. We, we probably each wrote about 25 songs and AK was like, He's a, or that, you know, <laughs> and then the ones where he's doing this too, and I can't even believe this guy because uh, he's an incredible singer, man. Uh, not only is he one of my best friends, but like I get this stuff back and I'm like, holy shit, man, uh, this guy can, he's still got it. He's getting older and he's just, he's just, I'm a fan of my singer, you know? Like, yeah. So yeah, I'm a fan of all the dudes in our band. But <laughs> well, that's good. I mean, you know, I always hear about, and I've been there as well as far as playing, and where you go into a band or a, some kind of a musical situation, um, and, and the people that are in the band together view it like, oh, we're just coworkers, right? And they don't have that, they don't have that friendship, they don't have that dynamic, um, and it it doesn't it doesn't work in the sense that on an album maybe you can kind of pull it off, but like if you do live shows people can feel that they can notice that there's not a camaraderie of some sort. And so I, I think it's important that you can be a fan of each other and respecting each other enough to say, Hey, 
I don't, th this is garbage. This is a piece of shit. This is awesome. You know, whatever, have that brutal, honest talks. And, and cause that way, when you get that material that really works, you guys are just like, Oh fuck. Yeah. Um, and you can't get that with people that don't really know each other or vibe with each other. It's just not something that ever happens. Well, yep. That's, that's totally correct. Um, I just watched a movie about that uh, the other day. Hired, hired guns, hired gun. Uh, the Jason uh, Hook movie, and it's it's pretty powerful, and it's you know like about musicians that aren't part of the band. Yeah, you know, I'd feel weird playing in a band and, and just being a hired guy, and all of a sudden I wake up and uh, you're fired, you know, for, <laughs> for whatever reason. You don't even know why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's tough. I mean. Hell, the, the ability to sometimes play music for a living, it, it, that that temptation for people, I think, is just like a lot of them say, I'm going to do what I got to do to make this my living. Um, so I can understand it from that perspective. But yeah, that every day, always wondering if you're going to wake up and, and not have a gig anymore. That's a that's a tough way to do it. I mean, I, I, I don't know how I would handle that. But uh, if you're counting on it and then one day it's not there, I mean, you can get fired from any job you have any time anyways, but still. There's something about that security that says, oh, yeah, I'm still going to be with these. Shit, even fucking Brian Johnson from ACDC, you know, that whole situation went all haywire on him. You know, it's crazy. Good he's back, of course. Oh, yeah. But, um, yeah, no, that's cool. You guys uh, clearly have some some amazing uh, chemistry, and, and I think that's fantastic. So, uh, End of Chaos, musically, I feel really... Uh, was such a melodic and technical album. But as you said, with the AK's vocals, I mean, as he's gotten, uh, I guess, I don't want to say the word older, but we'll say more seasoned, right? Um, they get throatier, they get <laughs> more powerful. And so you've really taken it to this very technical uh, power metal level, which I, I think is fantastic. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited to see, you know, what you guys, uh, I guess, pull out of the magic fucking hat when this thing launches. Uh, we're all pretty excited about that. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, kind of, especially with, with COVID, I guess, is kind of, it's related to that. But, you know, over the last several years prior to that, we've really seen the industry kind of shift from, you know, uh, focusing on albums as the main source of revenue to really having tours become the way that musicians kind of keep things going. And I actually saw a quote from you recently on an old interview that said, you know, I think it was, we only tour three months out of the year and then we're off to make another record. It's not good for a metal band. You've got a tour, tour, tour. And then now here we are, not tour, tour, touring. And I'm starting <laughs> to see, yeah. though, as we were talking about earlier, another shift maybe towards towards albums becoming a focal point. Do you see that as something that, that is going to kind of keep that ball rolling? Uh, I do. Um, and it, it's surprising because with the digital age, you know, there's obviously a lot of CDs and a lot of down more downloads than anything, but <laughs> it's going back to, to the albums, you know, people are buying the albums we took out on our last tour, uh, with our merch, you know, some like special colored records, uh, vinyl records, and, you know, just some regular black vinyl records. And, and we sold out of all of them, like before the tour is even done. So we're kind of like, wow, what, you know, what's, what's going on here. And I think people, um, especially the metal, metal fans, they, they like the aspect of being able to look at that album cover and go, oh, that's who's going on. Yeah, that's what this is, you know. And so we, we try to take our, you know, a lot of time with, with the record and make sure there's something interesting on it, you know, for people to read. We always put a thanks list and, you know, where we did everything. We try to we put our lyrics on there because everybody always wants to see the lyrics and, and read what the songs are about. So we definitely don't want to deprive anybody of of that aspect of being able to sit there and just listen to the record and and look at it at the same time, you know. Yeah. You know, I saw something on your website, which, by the way, your guys's website, I don't know if there was a refresh on it or something, but the, it's fucking a killer website. I love the discography section. Um, but it's it's kind of mentions up there, speaking of tours, uh that you guys had a tour scheduled obviously, and then it got canceled, but then it still kind of says maybe it's going to happen in April, which clearly that's pretty close. So what's going on with no. that tour? That's, is that still just kind of indefinitely pushed out? Um, that the, okay. First of all, the website, uh, this is a good, good story. There was uh, we played in Florida and I met up this guy named Joel Barrios and, um, you know, we started talking and he go, he's like, Michael, let me, let me run with your website. Let me revamp it for you. And, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't know him at the time, but over a few months, 
talking with him and, and, and uh, uh, he, he went with it. Uh, I did an interview with him, uh, I don't know, it was probably two years ago. Um, he does Sonic Perspectives. Uh, that's the name of uh, you know, a company that I was doing the interview with that he, it's his company. Okay. And so he's like, let me, let me revamp your website. And he, he, he did all of it. Uh, he did him and his wife put together the discography and did all that stuff for us. And it, it's amazing. Like, I, I don't even know what to say to that. It, it's such an amazing task and, and for somebody to do that for us. And, uh, and he's turned into a, a super good friend, you know, and, <laughs> and he, he's really good at what he does. Uh, he's a photographer and he does sonic perspectives. Uh, and yeah, he's an, and he's funny. <laughs> he's a funny dude because he's in with all of our chats on, on messenger and stuff like that. And we include him in with, with all that. And he's, he's, uh, he's right in there with us cutting up and, uh, you know, we, it's, he's just a fun dude. Yeah. So, awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where was I going with that? I don't know. We both got lost. I've, uh, <laughs> I've only had half. I've only had half of this. <laughs> only half of a bud. Half of a four point three percent or whatever's in there. So yeah. Well, I was I was mentioning the website. Love the discography and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, I just think that that's a it's a really cool a new way f- to to interact with people, and I, I think that they did a a fantastic job. So props to props to the guy who did that. Um, I don't exactly remember my or- original line of questioning on that at this point because I didn't really write it down. But hey, there we go. <laughs> so <laughs> it is what it is. So uh, you know, it's crazy to me when I think um, of Flotsam being around for going on goddamn forty years, right? I mean, it's literally creeping up on forty years, and I'm forty-seven. <laughs> and so you guys have been around for the majority of my life, <laughs> which is crazy. Uh, you were like, what, 17 or something when you got hooked up with these guys the first time? Yep, that's correct. Uh, I was I was still in high school and going off to Los Angeles to make a record. And it was uh, I had no idea what the hell I was even getting into. Yeah. Um, but I'm glad I did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. <laughs> It, well, so you've seen over the course of, of uh, I don't want to say the decades, because then we both sound really old, but over the course of time, you've seen uh, some some pretty drastic industry fluctuations uh, in terms of, you know, expectations from labels and promoters. There was a time kind of back in the heyday for me, especially like in the uh, the early to mid 90s, where we really saw that shift. And I'm in Seattle. OK, so you know, towards okay. the alternative movement, uh, you know, the, the sound gardens and the Pearl jams and a lot of the metal bands, uh, especially, you know, like even, you know, Queensryche and sanctuary and all those guys from here were kind of felt the pressure from their labels to kind of adapt that sound. Um, did you guys ever kind of have any of those, uh, pressures from, from the people you worked with? I know at one point you guys did some stuff, uh, at least a song with uh, Chris Cornell. Yeah. Uh, we did, ex- uh, get some of that pressure from the record label when we were on MCA. Um, Everybody knows who Michael Lago is. He's got uh, he was our A and R rep. He's the guy who signed Metallica. He signed us to Elektra. And uh, when we started going with the major labels, uh, we were bought out from Metal Blade. Went on the uh, these major labels in the corporate world. I believe what they were thinking it was going to be like a Metallica thing, you know, where there wasn't a whole lot of press on Metallica. It was a word of mouth. They got huge with the word of mouth thing, and I think they expected the same thing from us. And when that didn't happen. Uh, I think they started going, well, we're going to, we want to bring some songwriters in and we want to, uh, we want to try to revamp some things. So, so we changed and that was like during the drift wreck. So we ended up changing, changing a couple things around and, but I'm not going to say it was a bad thing. I was, I mean, anytime you're learning about songwriting and trying to write better songs, I, you know, uh, it's like a sponge. It, maybe it, it didn't work the way they wanted it to work, but it wasn't come out with a, a good record. I think Drift was a, was a great record. It had it had killer moments on it. And, you know, it's got good songs. So when it didn't blow up like Metallica, they were like, eh, bye bye, you know. Which okay. So then we ended up going going back to our our roots, you know. Go back to metal played. Now we're on uh, uh, labels that know about metal, that 
understand what we're what we're doing you know yeah michael lago our a r rep at the time he knew exactly what was up with metal he had his thumb on the pulse of it and he knew what was going on with us but i think trying to get the record label on board with uh the whole metal movement they just the, the suits you know they were like Ugh, terrified and they didn't understand it, and all they, you know, they saw. They didn't want their kids they, to grow up like that. Exactly, and then they saw. They, <laughs> yeah, right. And then they saw the success of these <laughs> other bands, and they're like, "I just need to get a piece of that action." So um, it's cool, though. I, I did notice that you guys never really, uh, even with the three albums that kind of came out in that era, there really wasn't a drastic change. But I, I did always wonder because those early scenes, especially you know, like you know, Metal Blade and and, and labels like that, were kind of known to push their artists. Uh, towards a certain direction uh now metal is metal and back then people yeah. were like i don't know what we're going to do with metal we don't even know if metal's going to stick around we don't know what the fuck's going on with it so it's uh, it's important i think to have people that understand the product and I, I guess that's a challenge for artists is really knowing how to break away from that temptation just to get on a label for the sake of being on a label i just want to get signed and they signed with fucking john's record label or you know whatever yeah. and and they just end up getting the hose, so uh, that, that's a that's a tough gig, I think, for people to understand how to how to work that out. You know, um, ACDC is like one of my favorite bands. Times I've tried to structure, uh, like it's very simple. It's really it's simple music, you know, simple guitar chords. Uh, great, totally, you know, but I can't write like that. Whenever I write three chords, it sounds <laughs> like dog shit, and that's just. And, and so when someone's telling me, hey, you got to write, uh, you got to write a song that's going to be simple, you know, keep it simple, stupid type of thing. And here, go and make a million dollars for us. And then there I am. I've got a G and A and a D chord. And I, I don't know what the fuck to do with that. You know, I want to, you know, and that, that's what I know. Uh, so to try to adapt to it, when they start, uh, the suits start telling you you got to do this a certain way it's it's like telling an athlete hey you got to run the same distance the same speed backwards you know and be able to do it backwards and forwards it's like uh, i can't run it the same speed. yeah speed backwards you know so I mean, that would kind of be the analogy for it you know it's really hard to do to break uh to break my circle i guess it would be yeah no yeah it, it makes sense i mean you know what you know it's you get pulled out of your box and uh taken out of your comfort zone and handed a, a list of, uh, I guess, demands, if you will, for what, what you're expected to make. And your brain doesn't work that way. It's There's a creative process you go through. And when somebody says, write a song like this, that's assuming you even know what like this means. You're like, I don't listen to that or I'm not familiar with that. So uh, taking somebody who plays, you know, licks and riffs and things like that and just, you know, hey, do, do me three power chords. Uh, yeah, it's and there's a talent in having, you know, very few movements within a song and have it still be, you know, catchy and, and people adhere to it. But I've always been a fan of the stuff that has constant change. Like I really like the different phrases and different time signatures and shit that kind of sneaks up on you. And all of a sudden, oh, where did that come from? You know, the surprise element I think is what I like the most about music. And, and there's other bands out there that make really solid songs, but they don't necessarily surprise you with what happens in them. And I, I think probably that's why end of chaos uh, and Flotsam was, were so fucking well received uh, in the sense of, of how well received they were, is because people were like, "Holy shit! Well, you know, where did this come from? These guys have always been awesome, but this is next level stuff." My two cents, of course. You know, that's cool. You say that because <laughs> whenever whenever he sends these songs back to us and he puts he writes his lyrics and he makes his changes and stuff like that, I have the same reaction that that you said you just had with the end of chaos. I'm like, "Holy shit! Listen to that." So I'm actually fanboying out on my own singer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no that's killer it's it's great and, and don't tell him i said that yeah yeah i'm gonna give him a call right <laughs> after this and we're gonna we're gonna talk about you but um yeah no it's 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 something that i think why a lot of bands burn out is there's that element of nothing changes nothing is surprising nothing is um there, there's nothing new to look forward to other than a same old formula and once once you're all about formula um then it, it then it just becomes a job then it just becomes you know perfunctory and, and and repetitive and then it ceases to be exciting and i think in order for my my opinion is in order to have that magic stick around you have to find out what what still excites you about the industry and I, that's a great question and so after you know being 
a musician for damn near a million years what what is it that kind of keeps you going like uh i how, how do you find the motivation in your day do you still just love it that much that you just want to keep making new stuff yeah you know i'll sit down just to um you know just to play scales or something or work with a metronome or something like that and i'll make a mistake and i'll be like wow you know what the heck and then next thing you know i'm opening up my pro tools rig and and throwing something on there and it evolves into something, you know, but, and that's usually the way it happens. But yeah, like uh, inspiration for me is, is a lot fewer and far between than it, than it was when I was uh, a lot younger, you know, cause I hear a lot of, a lot of music out there right now that sounds the same as, you know, it's different bands, but it still kind of sounds like the same band. You know, it's almost like there's a, a template or a formula that they're plugged into. And it, it, it's not that it, it's bad. It's just not my thing. You know, it doesn't, that doesn't get me excited. I want to hear, I want to hear the anger in the song, you know, like uh, right now I'm hooked on uh, the great chapter, the Slipknot, you know, I listen to that and I want to punch someone in the face, you know, like <laughs> it, it, not, not, I'm not going to do that, but, but if it's making me feel like that, it's obviously sparking something, you know, that's giving me some inspiration. So yeah. yeah, that's, that's what I like. And it doesn't have to be a heavy band, you know, I'm like, like this, I'm a, I'm a huge Dave Matthews fan, you know, but, uh, and you know, I, I think, he lives up there with you guys. Yeah, he's he's, he's been around politics, here. Politics, and now it's, it's hard for me to listen to him. So it goes, I think, with <laughs> with uh, entertainers. Uh, you know, in, in any industry, I suppose it's there's that uh, interesting dichotomy of you know wanting to share people, you know, what you feel and what you think, and some people want to hear it, and some people really don't. And you know, you've probably heard it. Just shut up and play, right? That's kind of a. I think there's a lot of people that they don't want to hear the ugly part of what you may disagree with them on. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I get it. Yeah. I, I like all kinds of music as well. I, I think, uh, you know, variety kind of helps keep you inspired. And sometimes you'll find that, you know, the, the genres of music that, that people don't think you listen to really influence your writing and your playing more than, than other people will give you credit for. So I, I always think that's uh, oh, pretty yeah. awesome. John Mayer is one of my favorite guitar players, and you know it's definitely completely the opposite of Ingve Malmsteen, who is another one of my favorite guitar players. But like, like it's emotional. I'll sit there and listen to that guy play, and he's uh, kind of got the BB King thing going on. He plays one note, and it sounds fantastic. And it's like that—that's emotional to me, and like, that's how I get inspired. Yeah, you know. Yeah, that's awesome. I think uh, people that that can take few notes. And, and make them sound amazing uh just just as just as emotionally awesome as somebody who can throw in 50,000 notes into a measure you know that's great too but you know David Gilmore is one of my favorite guitarists and just the way that he bends and just kind of the way he uses tremolo very very subtle um but I mean he can bend you know one note five or six times perfectly and it's amazing and I can't do that once <laughs> it seems but you like know what <laughs> if he was in the other room and you, you didn't know it yeah. and he was playing a guitar and he did one of those, those bins you'd be like oh that's david gilmore yeah you would you would know you would yeah, know you could just hear his playing and right? you got that kind of stuff one note just that's yeah that's amazing yeah um kind of switching gears here uh yeah i was thinking about you know we're talking about pro tools and we're talking about home recording and stuff like that do you think that if technology was where it is now 30 years ago, would Flotsam be an entirely different band? Ooh, I've never had that question before. Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Uh, and the reason why I say that is when I was right, when I started writing songs with Flotsam is I had one of those little, you know, those little tape recorders that they're little like rectangle things and it had the, a red button on it and I had two of those and what I would do is I'd record drums on one of them and then I would play it back and play along with it onto the other one and I would just keep bouncing and them back keep and forth. bouncing them yeah you know keep bouncing them and it sounded like shit when I was done with it but it was like I I, I was loving it because I was like multi-tracking and uh, you know it was the ghetto way but it, it was working if I'd had pro tools uh, back then um it it, it, I think the songs would have came a little bit uh, less tiresome for me. You know, I mean, that was pretty fatiguing doing that shit. Yeah. But, you know, I want, wanted to hear what these songs sounded like. 
you know, and, and taking that long when you're writing, it, it, it's detrimental to what, you know, the, the writing process, you know, because you're slowing stuff down and you're forgetting ideas, you're getting pissed off. With uh, systems now, you just you just run with it. You know, you hit a click track and you play along with it and you're done. Yeah. You know? So for you, really, the biggest difference is has would be the time investment it takes from point A to point B, right? Oh, yeah. I, uh, it takes a toll on you if, you, if it takes you. Uh, and, you know, this is weird. Steve and I talk a lot about this because a, a lot of our guitars on our records are the scratch guitars because there's something about that first take that there's fire in it. There's anger. There's there's just something about it. I, I don't know how many times I've retracked my guitars on these records and go, you know what, if I'm going to go with the scratch track again because there's there's just something about it. I can't put my finger on it. But we've had numerous conversations about it. And he, he does the same thing, even though it might not be perfect, but it's got the fire, you know. There is something to be said about not recording 30 takes uh, twice to have your tracks quadruple panned, <laughs> you know, and then uh, just having that, <laughs> that very, you know stereo just give me a left give me a right and call it good i mean that's yeah and then doing that all day it just doesn't feel the same it doesn't sound the same um even with technology where you can you know cut and paste and quantize and do all that crazy stuff that makes things sound very sterile uh i i understand the the scratch track um vibe i used to like that with you know the first vocal takes were always really 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 powerful especially in metal and then if you got your vocalist has done like 20 takes of a song in one day he doesn't want to come back to the studio for forever <laughs> that's a lot of work oh yeah 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 it beats them up pretty bad too you know the next day they're they're not able to sing at all yeah that's the thing about ak though you know he he does this stuff when we go on tour we're like okay we're we're him to do like the tarzan woo, on his screams never happens he's, <laughs> he's always spot on it's amazing motherfucker <laughs> yeah no no crazy weird off-key uh notes uh hey that also reminds me though because you have a reputation of being the gopro guy right i've heard you like to film shit is that true yes. that is that's uh you see all my i got all my stuff right back here i don't know if you could see it oh all. now i can see yeah, yeah there we go so <laughs> I mean, I, I assume that somewhere in your lexicon of, of GoPro footage that there's probably some uh, super embarrassing moments that the other guys would not uh, like to have shared <laughs> with the world. But uh, I assume that with the tracking of, of this new album, I mean, were you were you recording this? Was this is there going to be footage that kind of shares itself in some kind of a form with, uh, you know, whether or not it's bonus content or just shit you guys put up on the website? No, I, I didn't do too, uh, too much because I would have, since the separation, you know, like, uh, I don't go over to Steve's or Ken's or anything like that, but uh, otherwise there would be more. I've got a couple of solos that I go pro and, and that's really about it from my end. Okay. But, um, that's funny. You say that I have the reputation of it because these guys hate me for it. They're like, <laughs> they see me come and they go the other direction because I always got like, I'm always doing some, and I'm Photoshopping some some fucked up shit where they're just, they get pissed, you know, but well, they're not really pissed. They're just, they know it's funny, yeah. but they're just pissed because of the, the joke on them. <laughs> yeah. So as far as then the, the process, uh, I, I guess I had assumed that most of the tracking was probably done pre COVID, but, but how long were you working on this? Did you do a lot of tracking during this last year? Yeah. You know, um, uh, that, that's a thing. Uh, most of the time you have, a, you, you know, we have, have a record coming out you're on a timeline and then all of a sudden our timelines got taken away so you're like well i don't really need to do that I, i'm not really feeling it tonight so i'm just you know i'm gonna do something else uh, so that's not that's not great or anything like that but being able to this is the first record we've actually been able to take our time with and you know when we're doing our scratch tracks we're taking our time with them instead of just getting through them to write the song you know yeah so so i mean there, Good part. There's there's something good about it, but it's also, uh, you know, there's COVID. It's fucked everybody's lives up right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It has an effect on on your day to day, on your mood, on your motivation, um, for sure. I I totally get that. The funny thing for me was, you know, I've been working from home since before this started, so my my personal adjustment wasn't as drastic as I, I think a lot of other people's were. But 
the people that I talk to on a day-to-day basis, I can feel it from them, whether or not it's doing what you and I are doing today or doing it with, you know, clients for work or, you know, whatever, you can feel how everything has affected how they approach their days. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's really easy to say, uh, you know, I'm just not feeling it today. You know, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this tomorrow. I'm gonna do this next week. I'm gonna do this in three months. <laughs> I'm gonna go yeah. ahead and extend yeah. this deadline. And I'm glad we finished it when we did because uh, January 1st, uh, I got, I got COVID. It was, uh, man, it was, it was like the flu on steroids, but that wasn't really the bad part about it. The bad part about it was the uh, after effects for, for four weeks, you know, when you're just tired, you just want to go to sleep and you're like, God, I can't do anything. I'm just, uh, you know, yeah, it's definitely an awful thing. Yeah. I don't imagine that, that, uh, <laughs> that would have put you in the mindset to, to get work done and stuff like that. How about the rest of the guys in the band? Anybody else come down with it? Yeah. Uh, Steve had it. Uh, and I don't think anybody else has came down with it. We've had some family members, uh, come down with it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, fortunately, we've we've we're all doing okay. Just you know, it's scary for us to have uh, still have our parents right now. You know, and yeah. Uh, but I will say that when I had COVID, uh, beer does not cure COVID because I did <laughs> I, I didn't really stop drinking beer when I when I had it. You tested the theory not... of whether or not beer was an effective uh, vaccination yeah. protocol. Yeah, it, it didn't work. Maybe you just need a different beer. <laughs> So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe you needed more, you needed beer with a higher alcohol content, like some scotch ale or something, <laughs> something with like 9% to really, really uh, fucking yeah. drown that shit. <laughs> so, uh, talking about, you know, longevity again, uh, I'm curious, what's your perspective now that, uh, you can say that you've got fans, old school fans and new school fans. So fans from several different generations, uh, what is that like for you? Oh, um, that's, it's very cool, you know, cause, uh, we do these shows and you definitely see all the old school fans coming out, but you see their kids too. And they're wearing flotsam shirts and yeah. they know they know the words and it's like wow okay so you you're you've been bitten by the metal bug too and i'm glad that it's going to continue and it's not like anything that's going to die out soon you know metal is is getting strength and it's getting stronger and stronger and i'm glad to see the younger generations are digging it the heavier stuff the thrashy stuff and uh not just sticking with the uh asking alexandria's and you know the cookie cutter uh, metal bands that you hear on the radio. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> radio. That's a whole other subject right there. But yeah, you know what you're exposed to. <laughs> I mean, obviously you're, you're, I do radio. So, I mean, you're at the whim of what somebody else wants you to listen to. But uh, I always felt like the true vibe of a, of a band or of a musician or of an artist was getting a chance to see them live. Records are fucking great and I love them, but nothing, tops that experience of uh, of having a, a an artist that you admire or that you enjoy their work and, and getting to see them do it uh that really takes it to the next level even if you you know listen to your your cds and stuff on the radio all day long from your favorite artist but that you go to one show at least a show where you get a chance to see them and you're not up in the nosebleed section but uh get right down there on the floor watching somebody right in front nothing like that experience and i i think uh of all the things that I miss the most, it's it's that that experience, and especially with metal. I mean, metal's kind of a brotherhood, if you will, a sisterhood. It's it's a very a very fraternal. People really in the metal industry, I think, look out for each other, take care of each other. For the most part, there's always those ass wipes out there that fuck it up for everybody. But um, generally speaking, that's that's been my experience, and uh, I definitely definitely miss that. Um, speaking of tours, though. Um, so I was gearing up uh, for the Outlier tour with Violence. Um, so and, and obviously that got uh, got kind of yanked away. Sorry, Ray. I know you worked <laughs> pretty hard on that. But it kind of reminds me, didn't you guys? You toured with Violence at one point, right? Uh, back uh, back a, a while back. Um, that was yeah. That was like I want to say that was like in 1987 or something like that. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, it's been a, it's been a long time. We just did a show with them on uh, seventy thousand tons of metal, oh. so I got to reconnect with all those guys. And now that Phil's back in the band, uh, 
is is it was nice to reconnect with him too. It was pretty cool. And oh. they're still great, man. Seventy thousand. What what a concept that that blows my mind. I mean, I, there's been a lot of those kind of tour. Uh, you know, tour on the boat elements that I've seen uh, from bands, maybe hosting it on a personal thing. But uh, that's that's a bucket list event for me right there is, is to be able to hop on that and and check out fucking all those bands in one place. Uh, that would be a dream. How was that experience for you? Is that just super badass playing that? If Yeah. If you go on that, you're never going to want to miss it again. Yeah. Like you'll you'll be totally hooked on it. Uh, it's the best experience. It's one of the best gigs I've ever done. We've done that one twice. Oh. And uh the first time I think we went to uh, Turks and Caicos, and this last time uh, we went to uh, Cozumel. So, and it, and you want to talk about like the brotherhood, sisterhood, fraternity thing? It's uh, totally. Yeah. It, it's amazing. Like, uh, and even the crew, you know, the the crew on the ship, they all say the same thing. We look forward to this uh, uh, till the end of the year, you know, because. The medics on here are super gracious and they're super nice to us. Meanwhile, the rest of the year, you know, they get these these pe- these rich people that are like, oh, my steak's too cold. You know, give us a beer where they give us a cold steak. We don't care. It's <laughs> fine. But that's how the metal community is, you know. It's like bring, you know, let's let's all get together and just. It doesn't matter about that stuff. It matters that we're all together and we're we're doing this thing, you know. Yeah, supporting each other, you know, supporting the music and uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's fucking. Plus, you can't escape it, so you're forced to support it anyway, right? You're locked out there on a boat in the middle of nowhere. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> that's fucking awesome. I, I've I've spoken with a lot of people. I have friends that have played it and and have worked it, and uh, I just think that uh, one of these days, uh, when everything gets back, that's that's kind of my new my new life goal is to be able to get on that boat and and uh, hang out with everybody and have some fun. So, well, uh, you know, you should do your uh, do your show from the boat. <sighs> um, you could put in for that and you you'll get carte blanche on the whole thing oh. and you'll get to interview everybody and that'd be, that'd be fucking badass said so our next interview should be from seventy thousand tons oh fuck yeah <laughs> dude we'll make that happen then that's uh now the, if there wasn't already enough incentive just to kind of get to uh see the people face to face that i get to talk to across the interwebs hell yeah um well, uh, so I'm getting ready to uh, ask you some questions from some listeners who submitted some questions, but I'm going to pretend like I'm a listener for a second. Right. I won't really pretend, but uh, I just thought of this one last minute as I was uh, talking about your website and going through the discography, and I noticed something that I, I always said I would, I would ask one of you guys if I ever got a chance to talk to somebody in Flotsam. What the fuck is going on with all the logos? Um, there's like, oh, the albums had different logos, and and was there some kind of a a reason for that, or was that just you guys had a wild hair up your ass and said let's just switch this up a little bit, or was it label stuff? No, that was. Uh, this is a thing that's always bothered me too. I've been I've, I've been adamant about uh, this because you know once you get a brand, that first skull that we had in the first logo, I always wanted to stick with that, but. Yeah, you know, and this is this is the thing. We've had some members that have been felt creative and done some some different stuff and try to do it, but that's not something that I agree with at all. Uh, <laughs> I think we should have stuck with our very first label or our first uh, logo and our first uh, uh, like Flotzilla. You know, that's why the lizard is coming back because we're trying to we're trying to rebrand our original brand with our original brand. Does yeah. that make any sense? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, absolutely. And it's not like the other ones were necessarily bad. It's just, you know, when you see them, like I'm looking at the website right now, when you see them all together in a small space, that's when you notice it. Um, I mean, you might notice it otherwise, just you pick up an album or something. But when you look at them, I just thought maybe these guys were experimenting with, you know, what was going to stick. But then I go, oh, well, you look at the new logos and yeah, they're fucking back, you know, so. Um, yeah, I always I always wondered that, but I, it kind of jogged my memory as I was looking at the website again. So, uh, so the answer yeah, it, is just people just decided they wanted to fuck with it for a while. Yeah, and that was that goes for the label and stuff like that. You know, like there was a there was a time where they're like, no pointy guitars, no more pointy guitars. You can't do that; it's not cool. You know, <laughs> but look at it now. Yeah, pointy guitars all the way. You know, yeah. and uh, so you know. The, and, the, and the logo that's there right now that you're seeing on the site is always going to be that. Yeah. You know, you know, if there's any sort of a change, it's probably going to be in the coloring of the words, you know, but sure. uh, that skull is 
that is uh it for us you know yeah uh, um and the lizard you know yeah I'm everybody a, likes the lizard i'm all about pointy logos and pointy guitars i mean i have a v now that i've had for a while and i was an iron bird guy back in the day when i was playing so you know if you couldn't kill somebody with your guitar <laughs> or stab them with the headstock exactly. right and, uh, then you you weren't you weren't true metal uh the pointier the better right so uh well that's awesome well let's uh, thank you for answering that that's cool i wasn't sure if you're gonna say fuck you i wish you didn't ask me that but you know it is what it is uh let's see i've got a uh, a question from eric dixon who says what kind of motorcycles do you ride and what's the awesomest ride you've been on? And that's of course, assuming that you ride motorcycles. I don't know. Are you a motorcycle guy? I am. Uh, oh, cool. I'm still pretty new to it. So Eric, uh, what I will say is I ride a, uh, two sportster. It's a 1200 and, uh, it's the first bike I've ever owned. And, uh, terrified riding in Arizona because people, they don't see bikes here. <laughs> which uh which is awful but um we have some great places to ride we can ride up to the we have a canyon lake here which is a very nice ride and actually uh this coming up april i'm going for pacific coast highway to ride up from, uh, to san francisco from san diego so that's going to be my biggest ride so far and uh yeah I've, I've been riding for what like five years i love it i can't pull a wheelie though <laughs> I hope not on a sportster. Uh, so, I mean, uh, I, I, myself, uh, I'm a, I ride, I have a, I have a Harley and a triumph and, uh, in Seattle, it, it's brutal riding a bike in, especially in downtown Seattle. Cause number one, it's all Hills. And number two, everybody just takes the first chance they get because traffic is a bitch up here. But, um, yeah, yeah no, it's, there's uh, it, it's, it, I love, I love going for rides and I've never been to Arizona, but, uh, you know, some nice weather would be good. Riding in the rain sucks. And, uh, we do a lot of riding in the rain up here in Seattle. Man, I, I, man, if I, I am like, if I see a puddle, I'll stop and I'll turn <laughs> around and I'll go, I'll take an alternate route. I don't want any water drops on my Chrome. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a thing. Yeah. And I live down a dirt road too. So, you know, no matter what, no matter what I go out, what, if it's nice weather or shitty weather, then, then I've, I got to wash it when I'm done. And that's if I'm not being lazy. So, uh, well, there you go, Eric. You got that one answered. Next one there from uh, Mike Conroy. What's your current recording rig? What guitars and amps are you using? And do you still have the Purple Jackson? Ah, yes. Uh, Mike, I do have the Purple Jackson. It's hanging on my wall. And right now, I'm uh, this last record, I used the ESP. Uh, one of the uh, it's actually LTD guitars. Uh, I can take you. I can take you guys in and show it to you if you want. Yeah, let's let's or, let's take a look yeah. in the studio. Okay, let's check it out. All right, just in the other room here. So cool. I got my little man cave. Can you guys see everything? Okay. Oh, there's the guitars. Hell yeah. So this one here, uh, the shadows in the way. So that's my. That's the ESP that I just did all the recordings on the record. That's the LTD Deluxe. Uh, there we go. I don't know if you guys can see that. That's my original Flying V. The nice. pointy guitars that I was supposed to get rid of. <laughs> ah, that's never going to happen. And then here's the purple guitar. There's the purple Jackson. So, yeah. And then uh, I do all my rigs off right now. My amp that I'm using is... Uh, Kemper Profiler. Kemper. Kemper Profiler. Uh, I never have, I'm a super lazy, I'm lazy about my recording, so I, I can just plug it in. All my amps are profiled into that thing. Um, over here, that's made by Universal Audio and the KRK speakers and Pro Tools 2020. Gotcha. That's, uh, that's pretty much my rig. Got the rockets and the Universal Audio. Can't, uh, can't go wrong with that. So <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, hey, thanks for asking that, Mike, because I was kind of curious about that as well. Hey, what are you profiling then? Uh, what, what, what's your rig based off? Uh, Mesa Boogie uh, Triaxis. Triaxis, cool. Look at that. I, 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 yeah. I love the Triaxis. Um, I'm, I'm stuck like in the '90s. Like that's where that's where I'm at still. And I mean, I, I have a Rocktron Prophecy, which is my my main rig, but uh, it's a Mesa uh 290 power amp and that combo with a bbe is fucking sick but i've always wanted to try axis never had one 
Um, but those are super, super badass. And now you don't have to fuck with anything. You just plug that profiler and it's always the same. Yep. <laughs> uh, my Triaxis has got, there's two chips in the, in the Triaxis. Uh, there's one that's got like a super distortion uh, and they don't make that chip anymore. So I've had a couple of them and I always want that, uh, that spe- uh, I don't even know the name of the chip, but I always call Mesa Boogie and I'm like, hey, can you guys add this chip, you know, and, and I, I can't get the old chip in there anymore. So my Triaxis is, is a classic and uh, it's a lot of pieces that I would. Hey, quick rabbit hole since since uh, we're talking about Mesa. <laughs> um, what do you think of the – this is not a listener question. This is a mic question. What do you think of the uh, Gibson Mesa Boogie thing with them buying Mesa uh, or merging did with Did something happen while it's – Oh really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, I did hear about this. Uh, <clears throat> I, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that because uh, the changes that went with Gibbs that have been going on. I still love Gibbs and guitars. They're, they're still great. Uh, Les Paul. I wish I could tour with that guitar, but uh, I love it too much to lose <laughs> it. I guess. So uh, I hope that they don't turn Mesa into like what Gibson turned into in like the late nineties. Uh, which I don't know what was at their corporate offices, but it just seems like the quality kind of was just going that direction. I don't know. Yeah. I always wondered, you know, Mesa's kind of always been known as still that last bastion of semi-independent companies, you know, making everything still, you know, Mm -hmm. in the USA, you know, a lot of that stuff still made by hand. And, and so in Gibson, their new CEO seems like he's on a great track though. I mean, he seems pretty legit. So we'll, we'll see if they, let them remain operating the same capacity. Yeah. That's kind of, I guess, part of the deal is they still get to operate the way that they've been operating. And, and, and we'll see that new, um, that new rectifier, uh, what's it called? A Badlander or something like that. <laughs> Things fucking badass. So, um, cool. All right. Uh, I last... haven't played that thing yet. Oh dude. It's awesome. Well, I, that's assuming that you like, am rectifier. I missing out? Well, I mean, if you like the rectifier sound and just oh, yeah. wish it had like, just, just that much more like, I guess darkness to it for lack of a better way to put it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's got a, it's got a growl. That's for sure. I mean, I'm a rectifier fan. I, I've owned several of them. Uh, so yeah, it's cool. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a Mesa. I mean, you'll, you'll know as soon as you fire it up, but it's got a little bit of a different tonal characteristic to it. Um, all right. So here we go. Steve Santos says, Hey, I'm sure this is probably old news now, but what was the original reason that you left back in the day and what brought you back? Oh, that's a good question. Thank you, Steve. Um, I left because of management purposes. I mean, it was a combination of a couple things, but it was more of the management more than anything. Uh, we, we just wrote the high record. I did not agree with the name of the record. I thought that the, uh, uh, and I know a lot of people disagree with me on this, but I thought that the lettering copy and Van Halen and Metallica and all this sort of stuff on it, I thought that was cheesy. And, uh, I just was like, fuck this. I'm, I'm done with it. And the, the guy was an ass too. They got, or the guy stole a bunch of money from Flotsam. And I just was like, I, I'm out on this deal before I fucking chop this guy's fucking head off. And then, uh, so I, I came home, put everything away and, and uh, uh, just I got full custody of my kids, and we just hung out, went fishing, and uh, did some schoolwork and raised them. And uh, they turned out to be musicians, uh, really good, both of them, really good saxophone players. Awesome. Uh, they didn't follow the metal route, which is okay, <laughs> but they still have uh, music in their in their soul and in their blood, which uh, I'm very grateful for. Yeah. Well, so it sounds like you just got to lead the uh, the epic regular person life and and take a break from all the madness for a while. And I guess part two was uh, what brought you back. Uh, well, for lack of a better way to put it, it was like someone else was fucking my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> so, so I'm like, were... <laughs> I gotta, I can't let this go. Yeah, I gotta get back and do this. <laughs> yeah. So was it initiated by you? Like, Hey guys, what do you think about me? Uh, hop, hopping back on the saddle? Well, uh, Craig Nielsen was playing drums at the time and they had a show in, uh, in Germany. I think it was the bang your head festival. And he's like, Hey, you know, we, 
uh, who was it? Uh, Ed couldn't do it at the time. So he's like, would you like to come out and, and do the show? And I said, yeah, you know, hell yeah. I could go to Germany again. And then I just rejoined after that. I don't, I don't even know if they really asked me. I just, you just showed just up for the tour stayed. one day, said, Hey, I'm playing. And they said, okay, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's good to be wanted. Right. So, <laughs> well, uh, Hey guys, thank you for, for asking those questions. And, uh, and thanks Michael for, for answering the listener questions. That's always uh, super cool. So before I let you uh, get back to your, your nice, uh, Budweiser collection that you've got uh, worked up there, uh, what else do you want to leave us with today? Any tasty tidbits of what we can expect from you and, uh, anything you want to kind of close us out with? Um, uh, I just, I, I want everybody to listen to, uh, on April 1st, uh, the announcements that are coming out. I want, you know, I, I, I cannot wait to share this record with everybody and, uh, you know, I hope that you guys all, all still think that the old guys got, got it going. <laughs> oh, um, we're excited about it. That's about it. And the lizard, the lizard's excited too. <laughs> the lizard is excited now where i come from that means something entirely different but um we'll just let you guys uh run wild with that <laughs> visual image right there so uh well hey uh, cool michael thank you very much for joining me today on the show this has been an absolute blast and uh i definitely will be waiting for april 1st uh to to get these cool new announcements and uh, congratulations on your last few albums and and uh, congratulations on this upcoming one i'm sure it's going to be super badass Oh man, thank you for having me. Uh, I totally appreciate it. The band appreciates it, and uh, can't wait to get to Seattle, meet you in person, and hang out. And maybe, uh, maybe we'll drink a couple of these together. Yeah, we'll have twelve Budweisers, <laughs> and uh, and we'll be none the wiser. So uh, there you go, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Michael Gilbert, Flotsam and Jessam. Thank you very much, brother. Thanks, you guys. <laughs>